My name is Gustavo Garcia. I'm from House Party. And today I'm going to talk about how to optimize the video experience for mobile applications and how to apply some of the machine learning techniques to take this optimization one step beyond. Okay? So first of all, for those of you who don't know, House Party is a face-to-face -face social network. We are primarily mobile, but we also have Mac applications. 60% uh, of our users are under 24, and they spend an average of 55 minutes in conversations every day. So because video is at the core of our application, we obviously care a lot about the video experience that we uh, offer to our users, okay? But for us, the video experience is not only about the traditional video quality parameters that we are used to, like frame rate or resolution or encoding quality, okay? That's only one of the dimensions of the video experience. But there are other, other dimensions of the video experience, especially in case of a mobile application like ours. We also care a lot about the network usage because mobile networks are usually not as good as fixed networks. And because some of our users even have uh, limited data plans. And we also care a lot about the CPU and battery usage because we are in mobile devices and this is important for our users. Okay, and because all these things are so critical, we decided to uh, use WebRTC as the core technology of our video stack. Okay, but we use WebRTC, but there are many ways to use uh, WebRTC or many flavors of WebRTC. And when you make decisions related to architecture, to the features that you enable, the settings that you use in WebRTC, they have an impact in these three dimensions that you have to carefully balance. So our high-level approach or strategy for mobile optimization is around these four ideas. The first one is that everything we implement, every new idea, we try to design it and implement it from a mobile-first mindset because there are many uh, small improvements that can have a big impact on the experience that your mobile users get. The second strategy is to always prefer uh, native APIs, uh, for example, for rendering over custom ad hoc solutions. The third idea is that for any relevant change, change that we have in the platform, we always do A-B testing. We have found in many cases that we implement something that looks that should be very good for our users, but when we do A-B testing, the results that we get are counterintuitive and it's not that good for our users. So it's important that we always experiment with new ideas and new settings. And the fourth one is that if you want to provide good quality and maintain it over time, you should spend a lot of time in monitoring metrics and testing tools. So I'm going to give you an example of one of these mobile optimizations that we do, and this is about video resolution. So typically, WebRTC applications use either 640 by 480 resolution in case of mobile, or HD in case of desktop applications. And this is the resolution that uh, you get from the camera, but then WebRTC can do some, some downscaling in case of uh, network constraints or CPU constraints. Okay? This is what you get from WebRTC out of the box. But we can do more things on top of that. Like, for example, why don't we change the resolution that we are sending depending on the battery level of the device? So that when users are low battery, you can preserve the battery and they can have longer conversations. Or how, what's the impact of the layouts uh, of the video uh, in the resolution that you use? So if we look at the, a typical house party conversation with three people in a room and the phone in landscape mode, you have a grid like this, OK? And we said that we are using a VGA resolution. So this is what happens. We are sending this frame, 640 by 480. But actually, what is rendered in the screen is only 40% of the pixels. So we are wasting 60% of bandwidth CPU processing, encoding, and providing a worse experience than what we could uh, do. So we decided to implement a new feature that we call Video Resolution Controller that receives uh, all the resolutions that the uh, rest of participants are uh, willing to receive from you, you aggregate them and choose the best resolution to send so that all the pixels that you are sending are uh, rendered at least by one participant in the room. You, you don't send any pixel that nobody's going to see. Okay? And as, we said, as I said, we always do, do A-B testing. So we did this experiment and we got more than 10% battery usage reduction, longer conversations, and better user retention. Okay, so this is the type of things that we typically do to optimize the experience for our mobile users. And we have many more ideas that we implemented or that we are going to implement. But we also wanted to explore more disruptive ideas or new ways to optimize uh, the video experience for our users. 
So in House Party, we use machine learning for other features, and we were wondering if we could also use it to improve video quality. In, as you all know, when you are encoding video in a video conference, uh, the compression of the codes introduce some artifacts in the video, in the image. You get blocking, you get ringing, you get blurring. So those kind of artifacts that degrade the image. And we were wondering if we would be able to use these super resolution uh, algorithms to re reduce those artifacts, to improve the perceived quality of the image. Okay? We still had many open questions, but we wanted to explore this, uh, these options. We didn't know if this was going to work well for our use case, if we could do this in real time in a mobile device, or even how we would implement it in inside the WebRTC application. But this is what we wanted to explore. So the first thing that we did, or the first thing that we needed, is to find a machine learning model that could take the compressed image with the artifacts as an input, do some processing, and get a recovered image that hopefully will have a better quality than the, the original one. Okay, so we did some research and we found some models, and we decided to take one that is called ARCNN because it was popular, uh, the results look good and the complexity was not that big, so maybe it was a good candidate to run it in a mobile device. This model is composed of uh, four uh, fully convolutional layers plus uh, rectified linear units. So we took this model, we implemented it in TensorFlow in Python, and we started to train it with a data set composed of generic images. Although for the validation we used uh, real video conference images because we wanted to make sure that we were able to get improvements in the type of images that we have in our application, that are faces with a background, that kind of things. To introduce artifacts in those images, we use the VP8 encoder to make it as close as possible to our application, and the optimization metric, we chose a very simple one to start with, that is the peak signal to noise ratio. So we started to train this algorithm. Red line is the quality of the encoded images, so that's the quality of the image with artifacts. And the goal, obviously, is to see if our algorithm can improve that quality, if it can restore the images so that you get better quality than this baseline that is the image with the encoding artifacts. So we started to iterate uh, the learning process, and eventually we got to a point where it's, where it's stable, and more or less we were getting like one decibel improvement in the peak signal-to-noise ratio. That is good, and is what we were expecting based on the, res on the results in the papers. So once we had the, the, this model and we had trained it, the next step was to implement it in the mobile devices. Okay? To implement uh, machine learning models in mobile devices, these days you have uh, two main libraries or frameworks. One is MLKit from Google. That is a multi-platform one that we have used in the past for a smile detection. And the other one, just a second. <laughs> Sorry. Is the alarm to pick up the kids from the school. Uh, <laughs> so, and the other one is CoreML, uh, that is from Apple, and you have it in all the iOS and macOS devices. So, in this case, we chose CoreML because we were expecting to get better performance because it has good support for hardware acceleration and because we don't need to distribute it with our app. You get it for free. So, we implemented, we converted our model from TensorFlow to CoreML and we integrated it in our WebRTC application. So typically in a WebRTC application, you have a video track providing frames to a video renderer, usually a, an OpenGL video renderer. We put in the middle of our CoreML model so that the frames are pre-processed before showing them to the users, okay? And because we thought that this uh, was not gonna be useful for all the users or not even possible in some cases, we envision a dynamic switching model that based on some conditions like the, the frame rate, like the voice activity detection in case of multi-party rooms and the device type and battery level, it would enable and disable this post-processing, this pre-processing, okay? And one of the first things that we checked is what, is what was the size of this model. And we were glad that it was only 400 kilobytes because in the past we had bad experiences with these type of things and we wanted to make sure that the size of the model was not too big. So the most important thing that we wanted to test was the performance of this model, and specifically the delay that it was going to introduce in our video pipeline. Okay, so our goal was to get under 20 milliseconds, uh, but when we ran this in a mobile device, this is what we got: we got 2,000 milliseconds. <laughs> this was not looking very good, so 
<laughs> we were going to give up and cancel this talk, but we decided to spend some more time trying to optimize this. So first thing we did was, was to enable the GPU-only uh, support in Core ML, and that gave us like a 5% improvement. It's still not very good. So we decided to investigate some more radical uh, improvements. And we found a modification of our AR CNN model that it, uh, adds another convolutional layer. So instead of four, you have five, but with less filters. And that reduced the, the complexity by half. That is still not enough. So then we realized that in most of the cases when we have artifacts and we want to reduce it, WebRTC automatically reduces the resolution of the image. So we don't really need to be able to process VGA frames, and probably is enough if we are able to process QVGA frames. And that's reduced the delay to 120 milliseconds. Then we tried another modification of our first convolutional layer that is incre increasing the stride of the convolutional layer. That improved a little bit more. I'm not proud of this optimization. I tried in a newer <laughs> device, and I got 50 milliseconds. And once we had made all these changes, we realized that with this small, uh, smaller size of frames and this smaller size of the, of the model, it was more efficient to run it in CPU-only mode. So we got uh, a delay of 27 milliseconds. It's not as good as we wanted, and we still have some ideas to improve it, but it's not that far from the original idea of having it under 20 milliseconds. So just for you to get an idea of the type of improvement that it does to the, to the image, this is the original image. This is the encoded image with artifacts, with blocking. And this is the image uh, after passing it through our uh, machine learning model. You can see, especially around the border of the glasses, that the quality looks much better. So this is what we did. And we would like to put this in production as soon as possible and test it with real users to see if this really improves the experience of the users or not. But before we are ready for that. We want to do more training with more video conference images, focusing on the face re region. And also, we want to implement this feature that I mentioned before, that is the dynamic uh, switching of this uh, processing. And in the long term, we would like to explore I other ideas, like using generative adversarial networks to have more details in the image, or how to take advantage of the fact that we have more than one frame that we can use to improve the quality of the, of the frame that we are rendering now. And that's it. Thank you.